graduated from Sistersville High School in 1983, and I graduated magna cum laude from Fairmont State College in 1987, where I majored in English and minored in journalism and technical writing. I have been a published boxing writer since 1987, and since 2006, I have won 20 awards from the Boxing Writers Association of America, including first place awards in 2011 and 2013. I have been a voter for the International Boxing Hall of Fame since 2001, and for the past three years, I have provided input as to who should be added to the various ballots. Now, I don't have the final word, but I do have a voice. For the past 13 months, I have been a panelist on a boxing podcast entitled In This Corner, the podcast, with longtime broadcaster James Smitty Smith <coughs> serving as the host, and the co-host being Amber Renee Dixon, who is an award-winning reporter based in Las Vegas. The show can be seen for free on fight.tv, uh, and it's spelled F-I-T-E dot TV. Uh, the next episode is actually going to be posted on Saturday, Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. So I hope you'll check it out. And I actually watched the, the, the tape this morning. We recorded last night. And I got to tell you, it's one of our best shows. And uh, it's going to preview Saturday night's pay-per-view show between Terrence Crawford and Sean Porter. There are interviews with both of them. It's a really good show. I am also the possessor of one of the largest sports video collections in the world, and boxing is a big part of it. Since I began recording fights in 1986, I have accumulated tens of thousands of boxing matches, and they are on more than 2,600 videotapes and of nearly 11,000 DVDs, including every available match of Muhammad Ali. Finally, I have been a writer, punch counter, and the chief researcher for CompuBox, Inc., part-time since 2004 and full-time since 2007. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CompuBox, our company provides live punch stats for ESPN, Showtime, The Zone, FS1, and Fox. And over the years, we've also worked for other networks, sometimes those overseas. And since we've been around since 1985, we can apply long-term trends of, uh, of champions to predict who would win a given match and why. Now, of course, boxing is the theater of the unexpected, and, but we do get the result right much more often than we get it wrong. So that's a good thing. All right. I hate these papers. It's slippery. So now we get to the second question. Why am I here? Why are we here? In 2018, CompuBox president and founding father, Bob Canobio, and I published the book that you see over here, Muhammad Ali by the Numbers. And the story about how it came to be is a little bit unusual and quite organic. So another writer, Jonathan Ide, was writing his own book about Muhammad Ali. It's called Ali, A Life, and it eventually became a bestseller. And he wanted his book to have a particular hook, something to draw buyers. And his hook was specifically a definitive number of punches that Ali took throughout the entirety of his boxing life. And he contacted Bob Canovio. He knew he was the president of CompuBox. And Bob, in turn, contacted me. Now, we couldn't give Jonathan ex the exact number that he was looking for because in order to get that, not only would we have to have complete footage of every professional fight of Ali's career, we would also have to have complete footage of his amateur career, which was more than 100 fights, as well as every single exhibition and sparring session that he ever had. Now, no fighter in history has that complete uh, documentation of his boxing life. Even fighters of today, it's hard to find footage of every single one of their contests because they were neither filmed nor televised. But what we could give him was numbers from uh, Cassius Clay's 1960 Olympic gold medal bout against Poland's Zbigniew Piotrzkowski, as well as 47 
of Allie's 61 professional fights, including 43 of his final 44 fights. So we have a very comprehensive look, statistically, at Muhammad Ali's boxing life as a pro. So I dug into my vault and I began compiling the data, which required me to watch each fight twice. I counted Ali first, and then I counted his opponent. And as we went along, we forwarded the numbers to Jonathan. And somewhere along the way, Jonathan told us, he told Bob, you know, this would make for a pretty interesting book on its own. What do you think? Bob told me about what Jonathan said, and we agreed. It'd be a pretty good idea. And by the way, Jonathan wrote the foreword for this book. So how does CompuBox compile its data? Every boxing broadcast that you see, you have statistics and graphics showing the number of punches thrown and landed by, by fighters. I'm sure you guys know that. So during a normal live show, we have two operators. One fights counter A, one fights counter B, uh, fighter B. And we hit one of six buttons based on what we see. Miss jab, landed jab, landed jab to the body, Miss power punch, landed power punch, and a landed power punch to the body. Now the reason why we separate jabs from everything else is because the theory is, is that if a fighter is effective with his jab, then that opens the door for everything else. And as for the name power punch, it really has nothing to do with the force of a punch, but it's just a really fancy way of avoiding saying non-jab, right? Power shot. It just has more punch to it. So what makes this book different from every other book that has been written about Muhammad Ali? So one thing that we did is that we divided this book into four specific section, uh, sections uh, that covers a particular phase of Ali's career. The first one is The Young Clay, which covers the time between his professional debut against Tunney Hunsaker and just before his first title shot, his first fight with Henry Cooper. Virtually all of the missing footage from, uh, came from this period. Uh, 13 of the 19 fights are missing, but we were lucky that the fights that we did have were important fights. Uh, the first one is his national television debut against Alonzo Johnson. Uh, the next one is a tougher than expected showdown with Alex Mitev. And here's a little piece of trivia about that particular fight. Alex Mitev and Cassius Clay both appeared in the movie Requiem for a Heavyweight. Uh, I don't know if you saw that movie, but in the open, uh, one of the early scenes of that movie, Anthony Quinn was boxing this young, athletic uh, opponent who was just beating him up. That was Cassius Clay. And Alex Mitev also appeared in the film. Uh, it also starred Jackie Gleason and Mickey Rooney. You know, that, that's a pretty big deal. So the next fight in this section is uh, against Sonny Banks. And in that fight, Ali or Cassius Clay then suffered the first knockdown of his career. And it also marked his debut at Madison Square Garden. Um, then another fight in this section was his coming of age fight against ancient Archie Moore. Now one, another little factoid about this is that Archie Moore was actually Cassius Clay's trainer for his first fight against Tony Hunsaker. And because Archie would tell, um, would tell Cassius to sweep the floor and clean the gym and do the dishes and all that, he rebelled and he left. He said, I don't do those things for my own mom. Why should I do that for you? You know, so he left and he hired Angelo Dundee. So now they met in the ring and that fight is covered in this book. And then the final one of this section is against Doug Jones, one of the more controversial decisions in that period of Ali's, of, of Cassius Clay's career. A lot of people thought that Doug Jones won, but after looking at the film, that tells a different story. And if you choose to purchase this book, you can take a look and see what, what happened statistically. So the second section of the book is called Prime Alley. This covers his title-winning fight against Sonny Liston. 
and the entirety of his first championship reign. Those fights include his rematch against Sonny Liston. Floyd Patterson won, George Shuvalo won. We'll see some highlights from that fight a little later. Henry Cooper two, Brian London, Carl Mildenberger, Cleveland Williams, which is considered the greatest single performance of Muhammad Ali's career. The numbers will be shown here for the first time. Ernie Terrell and Zora Foley. I got to tell you, offensively speaking, the prime Ali was indeed prime. And uh, for the first time, you'll see the numbers of just how prime he really was. The third section of this book is called The Comeback Years. And this section chronicles his return from his three and a half year exile because of his opposition to the Vietnam War. This section covers uh, his comeback fight against Jerry Quarry through the Thrilla in Manila in 1975. Now the first three fights of this section, Jerry Quarry won, Oscar Bonavena, and Joe Frazier won, as well as his championship bouts against George Foreman, Chuck Wepner, Ron Lyle, Joe Bugner II, and Joe Frazier III are covered individually. But I chose to lump the other 14 fights into its own little subsection because many people see this as a separate part of Muhammad Ali's career. The expectation was is that when he met Joe Frazier for the first time, he was going to win back his title in a breeze because of how fast he was, how flashy he was, how overwhelming he was. But Joe Frazier had other plans. He knocked Muhammad Ali down in the 15th round and he won a unanimous decision and the numbers and everything about it indicated that Joe Frazier deserved to win. So now, Muhammad Ali was in the back of the line. He wasn't gonna get a title shot anytime soon. And so he decided to create a compelling case for a rematch. Whoever was champion, whether it be Joe Frazier or somebody else, Ali was going to, to be the guy that the, that the champion would have to fight next. And uh, so he ended up touring the world. He fought everybody of prominence. And the uh, included in this section is his first two fights with Ken Norton, his rematches with Jerry Corey, Floyd Patterson, and George Shuvalo, and the whirlwind war, world tour that he engaged on that took him to Switzerland, Japan, Canada, Ireland, and Indonesia, and all points north, south, east, and west in the United States. He fought anyone and everyone who mattered during this period. And then comes the fourth section of this uh, book, the past prime alley. Now, Dr. Ferdy Pacheco often said that Ali should have retired after the thrill in Manila. It was one of the most brutal heavyweight title fights in history. And this section covers the final 10 fights of his career, from Jean-Pierre Koopman until Trevor Burbick. And by the way, the 40th anniversary of the Trevor Burbick fight is gonna be on December 11th. The numbers in this section graphically show how right Pacheco was. And I believe that the punishment he took during this period of his career intensified the health problems that he would suffer throughout the second half of his life. So at first, Bob envisioned this to be kind of a nuts and bolts presentation of the statistics. But that all changed when I was doing research for an unrelated story that I was writing for RayTV.com. And I was looking through one of my old boxing magazines, and I came across a quote from Harold Letterman, who was then a, a prominent New York judge. This was years before he ever became HBO's unofficial official. And he had a comment about the judging of the Muhammad Ali Jim Young fight. And this quote made me think, and I thought, wow, this is, this is fascinating. This is something that you cannot find in a Google search. You have to have actually the magazine right there to read it. And so, and wouldn't it be great to include these little nuggets that would help tell the story even more richly? So I suggested this to Bob and he agreed. We should not only provide the numbers and the stats, but we should also tell the stories behind the fight. 
And the effect that I want to give in this book is to take you back to 1960, to 1966, to 1972. What were people saying at the time, right? What were the sports writers thinking? What were the fighters saying at the time? And then what was the conventional wisdom? Did the conventional wisdom hold up or not? You'll see. So the following June, I went to the International Boxing Hall of Fame's induction weekend, and there they have a book and memorabilia sale where you can get all the magazines and books and resources that you could possibly want. And I ended up buying every back issue of Ring Magazine dating back to January 1960 that I didn't already have. I chose January 1960 because this would cover Allie's, or then Cassius Clay's, Olympic run. Right? I wanted to see if there was any interesting stories leading up to that. And I also referred to autobiographies done by Ali's opponents, as well as YouTube videos and other resources. So as a result, this book has 26 pages of footnotes. So it's very richly researched. So not only will you read the stories about Ali's fights, you will also see the round-by-round -round punch count charts for each of the profile 47 fights. And then there was another dimension to this book, and it came out of the blue. Bob Canobio has a friendship with Bob Yalen, who is one of boxing's foremost researchers. And so as a result, we also have the judges round by round scorecards for many of his fights. And this feature is particularly important for his later fights in which some of the decisions didn't exactly match up with the action in the ring. I explained, I explained why I think this happened in the book, and if you bear with me for a few minutes, I'm going to read the first few pages of the Jimmy Young section. The Jimmy Young uh, fight is particularly controversial in this regard, and it really highlights the value of having the punch stats and the judges' scorecards almost side by side. So here we go. For Muhammad Ali, 1976 promised to be an extraordinarily busy year. Even before facing Koopman in February, Ali knew what lay ahead. Jimmy Young in April, Richard Dunn in May, a boxer-wrestler exhibition against Antonio Inoki in June, and the rubber match with the top-rated Ken Norton in September. Because each assignment also required considerable preparation inside the gym, Ali had precious little time to recharge his batteries, and at age 34, that process required much more time and, in retrospect, much more energy than he had at his disposal. Ali's potential reward for successfully navigating this ambitious schedule was massive, a gross that would exceed $10 million, and this is 1976 money, of which $6 million would come from the Inoki match alone, though he ended up being paid two $2 million. That's neither here nor there. It's still a lot of money. Business was booming, and the business of being Muhammad Ali was, at least on the surface, even better. History states that Ali avoided defeat in 1976 as he turned back Young, Dunn, and Norton, while also emerging with a draw against Inoki. Had Ali fought the same fights in the present day, however, Ali may have emerged with a 1-3 and three record. To most eyes, Young and Norton had done more than enough to win the title from Ali, while Inoki's kicks inflicted so much damage that Ali was fortunate not only to walk out of the ring under his own power, but to fly home without the resulting blood clots killing him. As it was, he had to be hospitalized for several weeks. Until the late 1980s, the conventional wisdom in boxing was that a challenger had to almost annihilate the defending champion in order to win the title by a decision. The common phrase used to describe this concept was that a challenger had to take it from the champion. Entering 1976, only four times in heavyweight championship history had a challenger won the title on points from a defending champion. The first occurred in February 1906 when Tommy Burns outpointed Marvin Hart over 20 rounds. The second happened in September 1926 when Gene Tunney overwhelmingly outboxed the beloved Jack Dempsey over 10 rounds. 
while the third saw Jack Sharkey beat defending champion Max Schmeling by split decision in their June 1932 rematch. The most recent example was when Max Baer virtually handed the title to Cinderella man James J. Braddock with his, with his excessive clowning before losing over 15 rounds. Even then, one judge, George Kelly, still saw fit to score that fight seven, seven, and one under the round system before deeming Braddock the winner on the supplemental point system. Thankfully, Kelly was overruled by referee Johnny McAvoy, who scored it 9-5-1, and, Char and Judge Charlie Lynch, 11 rounds to four, both of whom scored the fight in the ring instead of the mythical belt around Max Bear's waist. An added barrier for Ali opponents was that Ali was boxing's biggest star, as well as its greatest source of cash flow. He attracted massive media coverage before and after each fight, generated enormous ancillary income from the cities that hosted his matches, produced incredibly high Nielsen ratings that in turn resulted in huge advertising revenue for the TV networks lucky enough to get his fights. Finally, Ali's fights kept boxing near the top of the pecking order in terms of visibility and relevance. The depth and breadth of his celebrity extended into books and movies, as well as other avenues inaccessible to other fighters, such as fat fast food chains, and in the future, comic books, commercials, and even a Saturday morning cartoon series. For these reasons, conventional wisdom stated that once Ali's championship reign died, so would boxing as a whole. For those charged with the responsibility of scoring Ali's fights, this one-two punch of historical precedent and present-day circumstance presented an integrity-based quandary. If Ali's less charismatic opponent outfought him in a given round, would that judge acknowledge it, or would Ali's champion's advantage be applied? Since most distance fights have a number of swing rounds that are open to interpretation, that advantage could rob the challenger of a close but deserved victory. All these factors appeared to be in play on April 30th, 1976 at the Capitol Center in Landover, Maryland, when Young challenged Ali. The 27-year-old Young was the only child of William, an expert welder, and Ruth. And while Young always felt he was a good athlete, he didn't join any teams in high school. Young turned to boxing because he felt it was the best way to deal with his expanding waistline. Quote, I was overweight and I just went down to the Police Athletic League Center gym on 22nd in Columbia in Philly to work out with some guys I knew and lose weight, he said. Young showed enough talent to take his pursuit to the next level, an amateur career. There he compiled a modest 15 and six record, which included two New Jersey Golden Gloves titles. Young then turned pro with a first round knockout over Jimmy Jones October 28, 1969 at Philadelphia's legendary Blue Horizon. Despite the sensational result in his maiden voyage, Young was a Philadelphia fighter who didn't fight in the city's classically combative style. He was the quintessential cutie who put defense above offense, fed off his opponent's mistakes with piercing jabs and sharp counter punches, and specialized in making his opponents look bad. This resulted in paydays so sporadic and minimal that between fights he served as a sparring partner for Joe Frazier and Oscar Bonavena, as well as his future opponents, Ernie Shavers and Ken Norton. Quote, I worked as a sparring partner for Norton before his second fight with Ali and gave him problems, Young recalled. He never hit me hard, not that he tried to, but I could see then that if Norton was qualified to fight for the championship, eventually my time was coming too. Young's best victories came against Ron Lyle, Richard Dunn, and Jose Luis Garcia, but he also experienced setbacks. Shavers crushed Young in three rounds and held him to a draw in a rematch, while Clay Hodges, Randy Newman, and Roy Williams accounted for the other defeats. Young's 17-4-2 record boasted only five knockouts, and his personality, while pleasant, couldn't hold a candle to Ali's in terms of attracting and sustaining media attention. For those who appreciated the nuances of self-defense, Young was a delight. For the masses, however, he was a dud. So if the atmospherics and attitudes of the boxing world in general 
weren't enough of an impediment to Young's potential infection, ascension, his comparatively bland demeanor and unattractive ring style presented two more possible roadblocks to upending the great Ali. Ali, of course, won the pre-fight press conference going away. I'm so fast, I'll hit you before God gets the news, Ali told Young, a line that got big laughs from the assembled press. Boy, I'll hit you so hard it'll jar your kinfolks in Africa. Aren't you tired of repeating all that, Young said, chiding Ali for repeating old lines. That's been played out. No, I'm not tired. As long as I got new heads to beat on, they're going to listen, Ali shot back. And your head is new. Young's best attempt at humor was when he addressed Ali as a tramp instead of a champ. The line barely registered with the reporters. He also didn't impress the odds makers who saw Young as a 15 to 1 underdog. What Ali did not win was the weigh-in. Not only did Young show a much more playful side, the gelatinous champion scaled an unsightly 230 pounds, three pounds more than his previ previous career highs of 227 against Buster Mathis Sr. more than five years earlier. Meanwhile, Young was a fit 209, six pounds lighter than for his most recent fight, a 10-round decision over one-time title challenger Jose King Roman. After the top-rated Norton stopped Ron Stander in the fifth and Larry Holmes, a frequent Ali sparring partner, advanced his record to 21-0 by outpointing Roy Williams, Ali and Young took center stage and put on a most unexpected show. Now, I told you earlier about the nuggets that you find in the back issues of Ring Magazine. This is one that I found, and I had no idea that this was, that this had happened. So, speaking of sparring partners, the title fight was not the only time Young ever stepped inside the ring with Ali. On January 27, 1972, at the Hamptons Road Coliseum in Norfolk, Virginia, Young was one of four fighters who shared the ring with Ali during an eight-round exhibition. Young, along with Jeff Merritt and J James Tracy Somerville of Miami, as well as Buffalo's Johnny Gauss, sparred two rounds each with Ali before approximately 3,700 fans. Jersey Joe Walcott, who infamously inf uh, officiated Ali's rematch with Sonny Liston, was the referee here and Chief Second Angelo Dundee flew up from Miami to be in Ali's corner. When Ali was introduced to ringside physician Dr. Albert Thompson, Ali said, I don't need a doctor. Joe Frazier needs a doctor. Ali made $15,000 for the exhibition, while Young made considerably less. Here, however, the purses were far better. 1.6 million for Ali, plus 200,000 in, in training expenses, 85,000 for Young. So I spoke earlier about the contrast between the punch numbers and the judges' round-by-round -round scorecards. And this was particularly egregious in this particular fight. So in round one, Jimmy Young went 18 of 74 overall. Ali went zero for five. He got outlanded 18 to nothing, outthrown 74 to five. But according to the scorecards, two judges scored it even. One judge scored it for Young. So then we go to round three. And this was even worse. I don't know if it's even worse, but consider this. In round three, Jimmy Young was 21 of 78. Ali was seven of 26. Jimmy Young threw and landed three times as many punches as Muhammad Ali in that given round. But according to the scorecards, two scored it for Ali, the other scored it even. And looking at the judges' scorecards, Ali was given a maximum. This was under the five-point must system. So five points is the most that you can get in a given round. In the first 10 rounds, referee Tom Kelly granted Ali the maximum five points in each of the first 10 rounds.
Judges Larry Barnett and Terry Moore gave Ali the maximum five points in nine of the first 10 rounds. So by this point, going into round 11, all Ali had to do to win a decision was to stay on his feet. And given that Jimmy Young was not a puncher and Ali had a granite jaw, that was virtually guaranteed. But if you look at the video of the broadcast, there was doubt. There was doubt uh, that, you know, this is a close fight. People at ringside, they have it close. But they didn't know. And it makes me think, what if CompuBots had existed in 1976? It wouldn't come into existence for another nine years. But suppose we were at ringside and we were compiling the numbers and they were being flashed on the TV screen and they saw all the big advantages that Young was piling up. How would the commentary have changed? How would the post-fight reaction have changed? And then when the fight was over, it turned out that a very close fight was judged to be something very, very different. Now the final punch numbers, where's that paper again? According to the punch stats, Young outlanded Ali 222 to 113, almost two to one in favor of Jimmy Young in terms of connected punches. In terms of jabs, Young outland, out jabbed Ali 65 to 27. Muhammad Ali was one of history's greatest jabbers, and here's this guy almost, tr well, uh, almost tripling the number of landed jabs. And even in power punches, Jimmy Young outlanded him 157 to 86. He landed 50% of his power shots. Ali landed only 24% of them. These are numbers that suggest a massive victory for Jimmy Young. Now, there were several things that hurt him in this fight. There were several points in the fight where he was along the ropes, and in order to escape that bad situation, he stuck his head through the ropes. And that was kind of a cowardly way to get out of the situation, and so people held that against him. In fact, I, uh, the referee ordered a point to be deducted from Jimmy Young's scorecard at one point. Although, looking at the scorecards here, I don't think that penalty was assessed. But it only would have been, only made a bad judging situation even worse, because when the judges' scorecards were announced, Ali had won 72 to 65 on one card, 71 to 64 on the second card. The third judge, which was uh, Larry Barnett, he had it closer, he had it 70 to 68. That was somewhat in the neighborhood. But still, he voted for Ali. And this was, uh, this was unbelievable to me. So the fact that you could have, for the very first time, the punch numbers and the judges' round-by-round -round scorecards side-by-side -side, so you can compare and contrast. This also happened with uh, the third Ken Norton fight. It also happened with Bernie Shaver's fight. And when Leon Spinks finally beat him, uh, he still won by a split decision instead of a unanimous decision. Remember what I told you about the rarity of champions losing titles by decision, especially long-term champions and especially global superstars like Muhammad Ali. So, Another feature of this book that separates it from other Ali books. At the end of every profile fight, you will see an italicized section called Inside the Numbers, in which Bob digs down into the numbers and points out the most salient stats. Bob has a real talent of boiling things down to their very essence. He can say the same thing in a hundred words that I would need a thousand to explain. Shakespeare once wrote that brevity is the soul of wit. Bob has it. I don't. The book ends with a section that offers comparison reports for each of the four phases of Ali's career. You can follow his progression throughout his career. There's also a head-to-head -head breakdown of Ali's trilogies with Joe Frazier and Ken Norton, a chart that compares Ali's stats with those of 11 other heavyweight champions. How does he stack up with them? 
and the top 10 performances by Ali and his opponents in 12 different categories. And I can guarantee you that you'll be surprised by who led some of these categories, especially in the opponents, such as the man who threw the most total punches at Ali and the man who landed the most punches on him in a given fight. I was stunned by it. So, in conclusion, this book was a highly enjoyable and highly educational experience for me. Muhammad Ali was by far the biggest star during my early years as a fan, and I was fortunate to be the one who put together the CompuBox stats for his career. The biggest surprise for me, however, was how often he got hit, even as a young man. And I believe this is so for several reasons. First, when we watch video of Ali, our eyes often gravitate toward Ali. But in preparing this book, I was forced at least half the time to focus solely on Ali's opponent. And to my surprise, he was hit a lot more than I ever imagined. I knew he took punishment during the second half of his career, but I was stunned to see how much he took when he was a young man. And here's why. Ali's critics were correct when they said that he had lousy defensive technique. He often fought with his hands down. He pulled his head away from punches with his chin in the air instead of moving his head side to side like most conventional boxers did. He blocked body punches with his elbows fairly well, but he was so reliant on his reflexes with punches directed toward his head that it was dangerous. Before the first Liston fight, most of the reporters picked against Ali, then Cassius Clay, because to that point, he had been floored twice by left hooks, Sonny Bank, Henry Cooper. The Cooper fight was the one right before the title shot. And Sonny Liston's best punch? A left hook. So when, another reason is, is that when he did get hit, his face never really registered that he had just been struck. And oftentimes, he would retaliate almost immediately, wiping out the memory that he had just been hit. So one of the fights that illustrate how much the young Muhammad Ali was hit was his first fight with George Shabalo in 1956. And the sequence that you're about to see is the final minute of round two. And when you watch this, I want you to notice how many body shots are landed by, um, by George Shubali. Is that 11.30? Uh, it is, it was 11.25, so okay, it's 11.30 cool. right here. So here we go, watch this. There's one. There's another. There's another. There's another. That's a little low. Another one. There's another. So there you go. Now in CompuBox's world, a connect is a connect. And those were connects. And through the first four rounds, George Rivalo had built a pretty significant numerical lead on Muhammad Ali. Now in round five, he said, enough of this. I'm gonna box, I'm gonna jab, I'm gonna be me. I prove my point, I'm a tough man, just like George Rivalo is. And for the rest of the fight, he was dazzling with his left jab. In fact, if you count the final seven rounds of the Floyd Patterson fight that preceded it, or I think it's the eight rounds preceding it, and the 15 rounds that followed here, Muhammad Ali landed 10 or more jabs in a given round. That's very rare, especially today. Ali did it in 23 consecutive rounds. That's how dominant a weapon Muhammad Ali's jab was. And while Ali 
as a young man was dazzling on offense, especially with his jab and with his cross. He had problems on defense, problems that he covered up brilliantly for many years. So I don't think that there's been an athlete whose life has been covered more than Muhammad Ali. As I mentioned earlier, he was the subject of books, movies, plays, poems, and of course the Saturday morning cartoon series in his honor. But the one aspect of his boxing life that had not been previously covered was a detailed look of what happened inside the ring, the number of punches he threw and landed, and more importantly, in light of his later health problems, the number of punches that he took. This book, for the first time, reveals these numbers. And for that reason, not only is it an entertaining book, but also a very important one. So uh, do any of you have any questions about Ali's career, how CompuBox works, or anything like that? Do you have any questions? How, uh, have they done any scientific studies on how he did take all of that abuse, um, all of that punishment? I, mean, I don't. Most people can't do that. You know, boxers. Uh, they. They. I, I don't know how they do it because I. I dabble in in trying to box, and I learned very quickly that you have to be a special athlete to compete at the highest level. Sure. Um, they are. They are very very tough people, and a lot of times very desperate people. They come, a lot of fighters come from very bad circumstances and they use boxing as an escape from those bad circumstances. They're used to adversity and they also uh, ply their craft over a number of years. They get accustomed to taking other men's punches, something that you know the man on the street never could do. I don't know if there were any formal studies as to the constitution of Ali. I think it's, uh, it's the fact that he was such a prideful man. He was proud. He said, I am the greatest. And so he did everything that he could to back up those boasts. Um, the fact that, I don't know if you saw the, fir the film of the first Frazier fight in which he went down. That left hook that Joe Frazier landed on him in the 15th round of a punishing fight would have knocked out just about any other man. But Muhammad Ali not only got up, he got up by four. And he managed not only to finish the round, but he also, uh, he also put forth a counterattack that was pretty impressive given everything that had just happened to him. Um, he's just a very tough man, a very special man. One of, the, one of the observations I've had about Ali is that he is a guy who reached extraordinary heights in the sport, but he did it with the fewest weapons possible. I mean, he had a great jab, he had an accurate right cross, but he didn't, he didn't throw a hook very much. He didn't hit the body. He had lousy defense, as this book would prove, and yet he called himself the greatest and he lived up to it. Most boxing experts would say that either Joe Lewis or Muhammad Ali was the greatest heavyweight of all time. And Joe Lewis had every weapon imaginable. Ali didn't have those same weapons, but he made everything look right, even though he did everything wrong. Well, you said he didn't have much defense, but I mean, he had like zero defense at the end there. He was deliberately had no defense, and the rope dope you know, he would just take it until the other guy got obviously worn out and then he would you know, knock and finish him off. This so, was I mean, a, most people couldn't do that. This was a very early version of what would become the rope dope and there's a bit of a backstory there. The backstory was that you know, a lot of people were saying that Muhammad Ali wasn't a tough guy. You know, he was just a pretty boxer who used his legs and his jab and he was a show off and he wasn't as tough as George Shivalo was. George Shivalo was one of the toughest human beings ever to step between the ropes. Uh, he, as you saw there, he was a punishing body puncher. And Muhammad Ali wanted to become the first man to knock out George Shivalo. Um, 
He had a granite chin. He was an aggressive guy. He was a terrific body puncher. But he also wanted to prove that he could take anything that any man could dish out. And so that's why he fought the way that he did in the first four rounds. And once he proved his point, he went back to what he did well, and he won going away. He also tried the rope a dope against Joe Frazier in the middle rounds of their first fight. And Joe Frazier absolutely shredded him with body shots, just like George Trevallo did. The only time that the rope a really worked was against George Foreman. And George Foreman was so used to knocking out guys so early that when, after the first round, uh, there, there's a story behind that in this book, but the short version was, was that Ali originally was going to box George Foreman. But then he realized that the canvas was soft, and if he moved around for 15 rounds, his legs were going to wear out. He also saw that the ropes were loose. They were tightened from where they were earlier that afternoon, but they were still loose. And so he could lean up against the ropes and pull his head away from the plane of George Foreman's punches. And he also took in, into account the weather. Even at four in the morning, it was hot and humid, and it wouldn't do him any good to move for 15 rounds. And George was really good at cutting off the ring. So all of those factors came together, and between rounds one and two, Allie came to a decision. I'm going to give George exactly what he wants. I'm going to park my butt against the ropes. I'm going to cover up, and I'm going to let him pound on me and let the weather and his energy supply work against him. And the rest is history. He knocked him out in the eighth round. He became the heavyweight champion of the world for a second time, 10 years after he first won it against a bigger, stronger, younger version of Sonny Liston, and Ali was 10 years older himself. And when he won the championship again, he transformed himself from uh, a sporting hero to an icon because the odyssey was over. That 14, those 14 fights that were in the subsection, that all led up to the George Foreman fight. And that gave him the steel to withstand the punishment that George Foreman dished out. Do you remember how people, what people thought of him in his earlier career? Because I, remember, I was a kid, but I remember thinking, man, this guy is just so full of himself. <laughs> he's just so annoying. And then, and then he'd get in the ring and he'd you know, clown around and, and, and you know, do all this stuff. Other than defend himself, he'd just invite, invite and punch. I'm thinking, what? how come somebody can't you know, knock this guy out? different phases. Uh, early in his career, he was an Olympic champion. He was a hero in the United States. He was a, uh, he was a glib, uh, fun guy to listen to. Um, you know, actually, he wasn't always that way. Early in his career, and I think it was the night before one of his early fights, he was invited to appear at a radio station. And um, Actually, this, uh, uh, this city was going to host a wrestling event and Cassius Clay's next fight on succeeding nights. And the other guy who was being interviewed with him was Gorgeous George. I don't know if you remember him. Yeah. And when the interviewer asked Ali, or then Cassius Clay, questions, he, he answered as the normal boxer would, you know, kind of dull, whatever, he answered the question, but there was nothing exceptional about what he said. And then when the interviewer asked George, you know, his question, George went into his routine. He said, I'm the prettiest wrestler in the world. I am the greatest. Look at my golden curly locks. No man can beat me. And Clashes Clay was kind of taken back by it, but he decided to go to the show. And when he got there, he saw that every seat was filled. 
Most of the people there were against Gorgeous George. But Cassius Clay looked at that and he said, this is a good idea. I don't care whether the people are going to be for me or against me. As long as they pay to see me, that's the bottom line. And from there on, that's where we saw the poetry. That's where we saw all of the things that made Muhammad Ali such a special personality. So that was the first part of his career. Then, he, uh, right before he fought Sonny Liston for the first, for the, uh, for, well, actually, after he dethroned Sonny Liston a few days later, it was reported that he joined uh, the group called the Black Muslims, who were a separatist organization. And that transformed, uh, Cat, you know, he changed his name from Cassius Clay to Cassius X. And then Elijah Muhammad, who was the chief, uh, the, the leader of the Nation of Islam, then bestowed the name Muhammad Ali to him. And from that point, uh, by extension, and by some of the things that he said, he became the most hated man in America. And that was, and that was uh, amplified by his refusal to serve in the military during Vietnam. And there, it was a very divisive thing. A lot of his fights during the latter end of his first uh, title reign, uh, he was booed everywhere that he went. Uh, he was absolutely hated. Uh, his, uh, there were two opponents during this period who refused to call him by his Muslim name, Ernie Terrell and Floyd Patterson. And in both fights, uh, Ali absolutely tortured them. He would purposely hold back from knocking him out. Floyd actually came into the first fight with a back injury. And between rounds, his cornerman had to lift him up into the air and stretch his back. And so a healthy Floyd Patterson would have had a tough enough time to beat this version of Ali. But this, he, had a, he couldn't duck under punches. He was very limited. And he knew it, and because Floyd said the things that he said about Ali in the pre-fight, he just tortured him. And the referee finally had to stop the fight in round 12. Ernie Terrell, uh, they were buddies at one point. You know, uh, he, they, they drove together from, from a training camp. And Ernie Terrell did not originally intend to use the name thing against Ali. He just said Cassius Clay, and when he got perturbed by saying that, he said, I could use this. I can rattle his cage mentally. So he kept doing it. And during one of the rounds, I think it was round eight, near the end of round eight, uh, Ali said, what's my name? Bam. What's my name? Bam, bam. And he did that for the final minute of the round. And even though the color commentators kind of thought it was a joke, it was not a joke to Muhammad Ali. And the fight went the 15 round distance. The, uh, the numbers in Ali's favor were gargantuan. Uh, but Ernie Terrell was asked after the fight, are you going to call him Ali now? He said, nope, <laughs> nope, and he didn't. So, then he, uh, he, as the Vietnam wore on and as his exile from the ring continued because he refused to step forward, they took his licenses away worldwide. He couldn't get a fight. All sorts of politicians tried to find a state or a jurisdiction that would give him a license. And there were reports that some you know, politician would grant him a license, but then it would be snatched away because the political power was heavily for those who supported the Vietnam War. They controlled the commissions. And, but as the war went on and the, and the death toll went up, uh, the opinion changed about whether we should really be there or not. And as the tide turned against the war, they remembered that here is Muhammad Ali, the former heavyweight champion of the world, he gave up everything. He gave up three and a half years of his best athletic prime, his, his highest money-making potential. And they respected that. And by the time that he was given a license in Atlanta, 
the heart of the deep south. Uh, he was he was a, uh, a a political hero. He was an uh, an icon of the counterculture. And if you watch the video of the first Jerry Quarry fight, it was almost like a, a a happening, a social happening. A lot of prominent stars were at ringside, and they cheered every move that he made. This was in direct contrast to how he was treated during. Uh, during his career three plus years before. So they respected his stand and public opinion changed his way. And it got better and better and better, but then it peaked once his odyssey was completed against George Foreman. And, you know, Foreman was a heavy favorite. He was 40, I think 40 and 0 with 37 knockouts. Um, George Foreman had destroyed the two men that had defeated Ali. Joe Frazier and Ken Norton. He destroyed them in two rounds each. He was a monster. He was six foot three, 220 pounds, solid muscle, and he was intimidating, intimidating to the court. Sonny Liston even stuffed towels underneath his robe to make himself look bigger. George Foreman didn't need to do that. He was big on his own, right? So. The fact that a 32-year-old Ali would defeat a 25, 26-year-old George Foreman, it was unthinkable. By knockout, by knockout, using the rope-a-dope. Who'd have thought that's the kind of magic that Muhammad Ali was able to produce? Okay, Lee, he won like in the 60 Olympics. We know how America was in the early 60s, you know, segregated everything. Yeah. To what extent did he feel the world grow on his shoulders? He's not only fighting a human being in the ring, but he's fighting to build the social awareness. He was very aware. I mean, he, he traveled to uh, Muslim nations between fights. He not only was a sporting celebrity, he was also a political celebrity and he was a religious celebrity. Um, the, the Muslims around the world embraced him and they, they saw him as their champion. And a lot of times, right before the Patterson, first Patterson fight, he said that Floyd should never have said that. I've got a billion Muslim brothers who are praying for me and he can't fight that. So he had power beyond what most athletes had. And, uh, you know, so he felt the weight and the responsibility, not just for his own success in the ring, but also to support the people who he was fighting for. Uh, he he uh, presented himself as their champion. And when he won, they won. And if he lost, they lost. And it wasn't until he met Joe Frazier in 1971 that he finally lost. So that was a very powerful motivator on his part. General Lawson question, not about him specifically, but a 